Okay, having um, having developed a reasonable background now about random processes in random processes, how do we characterize random processes, random signals? We are now ready to take up the uh, return to our main theme, and that is communication systems, communication theory. We have studied in several modulation schemes by now, right? A linear as well as nonlinear, amplitude, frequency, phase modulations, and we have seen their pros and cons in terms of uh, system complexity, in terms of bandwidth, etc. Right? We have seen also their important properties in the presence of uh, uh, sinusoidal interference in some limited sense. However, one of the main uh, problems in communications is the presence of noise. As I have mentioned several times in this course earlier, noise is one of the banes of a communication engineer, right? one of the main banes. So uh, uh, whatever you do, you have to keep that in mind because noise is present right from the point at which you are generating your signal for transmission through the processing that you do at the transmitter then it keeps on getting added uh, while it is the signal is getting transmitted through the channel and most importantly because the signal is already very weak when it receives when it is received at the receiver at the receiver whatever noise gets added that is one of the most important components of noise because the signal and noise now more or less at about the same level right very similar levels whereas at the transmitter whatever noise gets added is much smaller than the signal power that you are finally getting um, that you are working with therefore the noise that is added at the transmitter is not that crucial not that important the ones that is added during the transmission through the channel and more importantly the one that gets added at the receiver itself is the one which really affects you very significantly in terms of system performance. So what we like to now study is how do those various uh, do these various modulation schemes that we discussed compare with each other in the presence of noise? Is some is any of them okay? Uh, someone some of them better, etc. And things like that. We like to uh, answer these questions. And now we are ready with the tools that are required for carrying out this analysis. We'll use those tools, right? We know how to model noise. And once we know how to model noise, we can analyze the performance of the system through which noise as well as signal are getting processed. Okay? So that is our objective for the next few uh, lectures. To start with, let us look at the model that we will use for the communication system for our discussion. You we'll start with, if you remember, the message signal MT and then you have a transmitter and here the transmitter includes everything that you could have. There could be some filters here. Uh, maybe like we have in uh, uh, FM, some pre-emphasis filters, right? There could be a modulator, there could be a power amplifier, right? Before it is transmitted into the channel, so the transmitter is everything here. I'm not going into the breakup of the transmitter because that will depend on the specific scheme that you are working with, right? And we are looking at the very basic level diagram right now. Then the transmitter output is what gets transmitted through some physical channel, right? through some physical medium, it could be a pair of wires, it could be a wireless transmission, it could be a coaxial cable, it could be optical fiber, right? the physical channel could take any of these uh, shapes. Now we also model the channel, See, channel so far for us was an entity which could modify the spectrum of the signal right? in terms of uh, some transfer function, right? We, we could assume that the channel has is a kind of a linear filter, which could modify the spectrum of the transmitted signal, right? And we had established conditions under which these modifications would be acceptable. You know, we had established conditions for distortionless transmission, for example, right? That is, the amplitude response should be flat across the bandwidth of the signal, and the phase response should be linear across the bandwidth of the signal. So far, we have modeled the channel like that. Now we will also try to model the, the noise that gets added as more or less as if it is a channel which is a culprit. Right? So uh, usually the noise that gets added 
is shown along with the channel in the form of this block here. So, we call it the channel noise. and that is denoted by the symbol n of t. Okay. Now, one point that I like to make here is not all the noise is getting added due in, the, in the passage through the transmission through the channel. Right? As I said a lot of the noise gets added at the receiver itself. Right? However, for the purpose of our modeling we will show the noise as getting added just at the input to the receiver as if the channel is a culprit and we will call it channel noise. So, whether the noise gets added at the transmitter, whether it is getting added in the receiver or whether it is getting added by the channel, right? all of them are getting clubbed together for the purpose of modeling the effect and we are saying that is the total amount of noise that is present and that is adding to the incoming signal and that is what you are receiving. So, we are modeling this addition right at the input to the receiver. So, the next block is the receiver. And your receiver again is a very generic receiver, it includes everything that you may have in a particular system right? in, for, for this discussion. For example, it will contain some front end filtering that you may want to do to reject other signals. Right? There are many signals coming in and you would just like to accept uh, tune into the signal of interest. It could uh, include some uh, uh, let us say demodulation, it could do include some de-emphasis filtering etcetera. So, the receiver contains one of the main functions of the receiver along with the other functions of course, it has to do the demodulation, but one of the main functions of the receiver is to limit the amount of noise that finally gets through to the output while the signal should go, go through nicely right? without any distortion the noise should get attenuated as much as possible. So, and that is typically done through suitable presence of suitable filters of the receiver. Right? So, that is the overall block diagram in which in which we will uh, now concentrate. To introduce some parameters the transmitter output we will say has some power which will de denote by S sub t. So, S sub t is the transmitted power because our performance will be in terms of um, what we call signal to noise ratio finally at the output. So, we like to talk in terms of signal powers and noise powers. Right? So, this is the amount of power that is being transmitted. Let us say at the, the most important parameters which are of interest are at the input to the receiver. Right? Not, the, the, not the entire amount of power that is transmitted is received at the receiver. Obviously, there is a lot of attenuation taking place in the channel and finally, what you receive is some power S sub i. Right? And let us say the noise power at the input to the receiver is n sub i. So, the subscript i here stands for input to the receiver right? and let us say the noise or uh, the signal power at the output of the re receiver is S sub o and the signal power at the output uh, noise power at the output of the receiver is n sub o. So, basically S sub o let us say you know you will have a signal what you are saying is the input to the receiver Consist of, uh, consists of a signal component plus a noise component. Right? The signal component has a power S sub i and the noise component has a power <coughs> N sub i. The receiver at the output <coughs> also will have a signal component which I will denote by S sub o the desired signal component plus a noise component which I can designate as n sub o. If the receiver was perfect the noise will be completely eliminated and only the signal will come through, but you can never design such a perfect receiver <coughs> for reasons which should be more or less obvious, but they will become obvious if they are not so right now. Uh, Let us say this signal component is associated with an output power s sub o and the noise power n sub o. Right? And the figure of merit which is of interest to us is the relative values of these two powers. <coughs> right? So, 
the output signal to noise power ratio when I say output I mean at the output of the receiver the signal that is finally going to be heard or seen by the actual uh, receiver the actual user right the uh, power ratio of these two entities at that point is a figure of merit for any communication system. So that is our desired figure of merit this is what we are interested in to find out the value of the output signal to power ratio. <coughs> Okay. Just to give you a feel for uh, what kind of signal to power ratios are useful or typical required values in various applications in uh, for, for the for voice signals let us say if you are talking about voice signals you could be talking about voice signals over various or uh, in various situations let us say you are transmitting a voice signal over a telephone line right if the signal to noise ratio is in the range of 5 to 10 decibels right it typically all signal to power ratios are measured in decibel units right which is if you have the power <coughs> units you take the 10 log of the power units so whatever is the actual value of the ratio take 10 log of that log to the base 10 and multiply it by 10 right so if the signal to noise ratio is 5 to 10 dB you will find that the voice signal is barely intelligible you can just about make out that something is being spoken right. Typical telephone quality speech that is uh, that you uh, work with that you is associated with a signal to noise ratio of 25 to 35 dB at the output right. So telephone quality is just to give you some feel for what kind of values are desirable finally right so that will give you a feel. When you come to broadcast quality for example the music that you hear in a, a radio receiver a good broadcast quality uh, signal to noise ratio is in the range of 45 to 55 dB that is noise has to be really really very small uh, finally that comes out along with the signal so there is broadcast quality right. Similarly for the picture signals so let us say in television you have again the broadcast quality SNR right whether it is a picture as well as a uh, device the SNR that we are talking about is of this order right again in broadcast quality. So I hope you understand what this uh, for example if the signal to noise ratio is 10 dB. Uh, what are we talking about? We are talking about the signal being about 10, 10 times stronger than um, the noise in terms of power because 10 log of 10 would be 10 whereas if it is 20 dB it will be 100 times stronger 30 dB means 1000 times stronger right it is a scale of it is a log scale and so on and so forth. So 50 dB means is 10,000 times stronger 10,000 or more. 1 lakh times stronger right 100,000 times stronger. So, but images require less I think less signal to No, when you talk about images as it is to be seen on a television right you require very good quality more or less same as voice. So, this figures give you a feel for the kind of SNRs which will be acceptable in various applications right. Now, uh, keeping that in mind uh, just at the back of in, in your at the back of your mind let us start with some discussion on how do we calculate this output SNR okay, in, in terms of input SNR right. So let us talk about um, to start with very simple communication systems just the way we started earlier in our discussion we will go through the same sequence remember we started with discussion of baseband systems then we went to AM systems and then we went to FM and phase modulation systems. So we will we will repeat that chronology except that we already know what these systems are all about we just want to understand how they have to be modeled and analyzed in terms of 
SNR performance. That's our objective here, right? So let's uh, talk about basement systems. And you know, uh, what are basement systems? Basement communication systems. Systems are those which in which we do not carry out a modulation process to carry out frequency translation. Basically, we take the signal itself and transmit it as such without any modification, right? For example, um, in a telephone uh, or a pair of wires connecting your home to the exchange, right? So, it could be a pair of wires, the transmission could be through a pair of wires. So, basically, we are saying transmission without modulation, that is what I mean by a basement system. Okay. So, it could be a pair of wires, the transmission, it could be through coaxial cables, but mainly these will be short haul links. Typically, if you have to transmit over a longer distances, typically multiple signals will have to be transmitted and modulation will have to be carried out, right. But over short haul links or between one user and the exchange, this is the kind of situation you will face, right. Or for example, your uh, digital communication uh, that you take uh, that you do on a ethernet right it's done through a coaxial cable and the transmission is baseband right so so mainly short haul links although uh, we'll do this analysis for this specific situation we'll find that whatever tools it's really very simple analysis and the arguments will be more or less directly valid for the modulation systems right. So, let us do it a little carefully. The other reason why we want to do baseband systems is because of the fact uh, other than the simplicity that is associated with them is it will serve as a benchmark whatever performance we get in this case will serve as a benchmark for all other systems right because if you have modulation and if you do not have modulation how do they compare with each other right. So, this is a relevant question we will try to address that question. Now, to model the baseband system and yes, uh, of course, we are saying that it is without modulation, but it does not mean that you do not do any processing whatsoever. You could for example, in the most general situation have some kind of filtering done at the transmitter itself. So, I'm at the transmitter, the transmitter block I am now designated uh, as a filter. For example, it could be a pre-emphasis filter. You could have pre-emphasis and de-emphasis even in baseband systems, right. Certain frequency components may have to be enhanced certain frequency components may have to be de-emphasized at the, at the corresponding frequency components may have to be de-emphasized at the receiver. So, it could be or you may not have it right and then so in, in this particular case the transmitter either contains this filter or does not have this filter and that is about it there is nothing else in the transmitter in a baseband system you just amplify the signal have sufficient power in it and so that it can drive the line through which it is being transmitted. Right. That is the only processing you are doing, amplify it, power amplify it, right. have sufficient power to drive the pair of wires through which it has to be finally transmitted. Right. So, that you get a reasonable strength of the signal at the other end of the line, right. that is the only processing you are doing, nothing else or at best you may be doing some filtering for some reason. Then comes the channel, the channel as said would in this case be both a transfer function which I am denoting by H C omega and a noise addition process as before and at the receiver you would have some kind of filtering for two reasons one because you are, if you use a pre-emphasis filter you must then use a de-emphasis filter. In any case you must have a filter which will limit the passage of amount of noise that will finally goes, go through right. So, that is the uh, main function of the receiver it has to eliminate. Um, so, let us say if you could say that the purpose of this filter could be to limit the transmission spectrum, L limit the spectrum to some given bandwidth that is the main purpose. The main purpose of the receiver filter is to eliminate what we call out of band noise. Right? 
that is the best that you can expect from any receiver filter uh, in terms of what it can do to the noise. I, if you try to eliminate noise which lies in the same bandwidth as the signal and it will also try to eliminate the signal. signal right. So, basically the only thing you can really do is eliminate out of band noise right and that is what the receiver will really do. And as I said these can also serve the additional purpose of P emphasis and T emphasis. So, with this as a model now let us uh, also talk about our in, if you remember our input is the message signal empty right. So, to get we to also have some kind of a model for empty because we are talking about uh, we are going to talk about power of the signal that is transmitted. So, let us say we will model MT also as some kind of a random signal right. Actual signals most actual signals of interest which carry some information again this is a discussion that we had at the beginning of this course they must necessarily be random right. You do not want to transmit something very very precisely known there is no need to transmit such a thing. So, MT also can be modeled as a random signal. So, and therefore, we will model this as a 0 mean white sense stationary process. So, this is now we already started to talk in the language of random processes, right. We will assume that the signal of interest also is some kind of a random process, <coughs> excuse me, which is band limited to it has a band, the signal has a bandwidth of B hertz. So, we say it is band limited to b hertz. So, your desired signal MT which you want to replicate at the receiver output is being modeled as a 0 mean white cell stationary process of bandwidth p hertz ok. So, this characterization makes sense when I say bandwidth band limited to b hertz what does it mean that the power spectrum of this white cell stationary process because we will not talk in terms of spectrum now we will talk in terms of power spectrum is limited between minus p and plus p right that is what it means. Let us assume that we do not have any pre emphasis and de emphasis filters, but these are replaced by ideal low pass filters right. So, both your transmitter filter as well as the receiver filter for this in the first in the first instance we will replace them with ideal low pass filter. The purpose of this ideal low pass filter is to make sure the only signal that goes through is the signal it is uh, only this empty passes through and if there is some other noise or something that is being generated here that does not go through right at least some portion of that does not go through. So, basically it limits the spectrum to B hertz right. Similarly we will assume that the I this filter is also an ideal low pass filter a bandwidth P ok. So, uh, what about the channel? We will say something about the channel also. In the first instance, in fact, in most of the calculation that we will do, we will assume that channel for the purpose of signal to noise ratio analysis that we are going to do for this purpose, we will assume that the channel is otherwise ideal, right. That is, it is a distortionless channel. So, if it is a distortionless channel, what will be the characteristic of HC omega? It will again be ideal low pass filter with either 0 phase characteristics or linear phase characteristics. Right. So, that is H c omega, H p omega and H t omega are all being modeled as low pass filters in this in this situation because we are saying that the only effect of the channel uh, only effect of the channel that we are interested in studying at this moment is the effect of noise. So, we idealize everything else right. We idealize the transmitter filter, the receiver filter as well as the channel. We, we do not want to get confused right. We do not want to mix up the effect of this as well as that. So, let us look at only the effect of noise assuming that the channel is otherwise ideal. So, we will say here that in H p omega, H c omega and H t omega will all be modeled as ideal low pass filters with bandwidth p. You understand what I mean by ideal low pass filter that means they have this kind of transfer function. right constant between minus p to plus p and 0 outside right. This is the amplitude characteristics the phase response could be either 0 for all frequencies or 
linear right over the bell again it has to be linear only over the bandwidth of interest okay now in this situation your come back to this diagram here you have a certain receiver a signal input power here and the signal has a bandwidth of b right what will be the signal output power here this being a low pass low pass filter of bandwidth p will there be any difference in the two the output signal will be the same as the input signal right because it has a the input signal has a spectrum power spectrum which extends up to b hertz this is an ideal filter which does not do anything to the spectrum as long as it lies within b hertz so basically you see the same thing at the output right it looks it's a perfect thing so output signal s not would be the same as the input signal power s sub i right so it is clear that for this case if you were to calculate the output signal power and the noise power since s o t would be equal to s i t right the two will be the same this implies that the output signal power would be the same as the input signal power input to the receiver is it okay what can you say about the noise power that will come out right now to do that we have to make some assumptions regarding the noise power spectrum noise again we will model as a now we will have to first model noise okay before we talk about output noise power let us talk about modeling of the noise what kind of model is appropriate for noise first of all uh, it is reasonable to say that it will be a zero mean WSS process just like the signal in addition we can usually assume that it is Gaussian although Gaussianity is not going to be central to our discussion because as long as it is white sun stationary we will anyway work with only for first two movements but it helps us to keep in mind that if it is a Gaussian process the first two movements are complete descriptions anyway right. So it will be assumed to be zero mean WSS Gaussian noise process right in general it could have some arbitrary power spectrum right. So let us say has a power spectrum a power spectral density function which is designated uh, denoted by s sub n f or s sub n omega right uh, usually uh, we'll, in fact most of the time we will work with that model uh, usually the if you remember our discussion in this context I said that the kind of noise that we generally deal with in communication systems namely thermal noise short noise etc can be modeled as a very wide spectrum noise right and therefore all practical purposes can be considered to be a white noise process. So it will usually be equal to a constant power spectral density function existing equal to let us say some value n0 by 2 for all frequencies between uh, uh, all values of f less than infinity. Or for all f. Uh, there is a slight confusion here in notation, is not it? I will not call it n sub o, I will simply call it n because n sub o I have already used for some others output, like output, um, output, output noise, noise power, right? Whereas this is respect the units of this would be different from the units of the output noise power. What will be the units of this? It will be suppose the units of power are watts, this is a density power function. Power per unit this will be watts per hertz right so whereas this is watts per hertz power will be measured in watts so can you please explain this particular what is psd power spectral density you forgotten sir that's okay but sir we are assuming noise to be gaussian noise precession right this is psd is for okay let's let's this is an important point we must understand this point what is our understanding of second order characterization of a random process Gaussianity is not that important for that purpose. What is important is we must know the mean value function of the process. If it is white sense stationary, the two parameters which will characterize the second order description 
is the zero uh, the mean value function what should be the mean value to process and what should be the autocorrelation function or equivalently the power spectral density function because the autocorrelation function and the power spectral density function are fully transformed pairs right. So the second order description characterization of a white sense stationary process is through the zero mean uh, is through the mean value function and through the autocorrelation function or equivalently through the mean value function and the power spectral density function and that is precisely what I am specifying. I am saying that the process is zero mean that is the mean value function is constant equal to 0 for all time right mu x t is equal to 0 when I say 0 mean it means the process mean value function is 0 whereas it is it's, then you have to specify its autocorrelation function or equally I can specify the power spectral density function therefore it has some pairs when I say that it is white this means the power spectral density function is constant and the corresponding autocorrelation function would be an impulse function. Sir, you remember that? Yes, sir. So, sir, only saying that the uh, noise is a Gaussian noise process. Gaussian is the Gaussianity is not even required in this description. So, it does not uh, Gaussianity do not say that it is PSP. Gaussianity has to do with the density function, right? So, it do not. the first, first order and the second order descriptions are very gross characterizations of the density function itself right density function at various times or joint or joint density functions right however if I know that this is also a Gaussian process then I know that given this knowledge I can generate the density function of the process at first order density function second order density function third order density function through the general expression that I discussed last time for a Gaussian process right if I know the autocorrelation function I can find out the joint density function of x t 1 and x t 2 right. I can join and find out the third order density function also, fourth order density function also for, for a Gaussian process not otherwise. Sir so it will be better hmm? if we say something say it something like white, white noise Gaussian process. I am coming to that right. So let me if we assume it is white yeah. we also say it is white Gaussian right. If you assume it is white. If you do not assume it is white, it is simply a Gaussian process, okay. So, all of us, uh, all of us are on the same wavelength now. We understand what we are talking about in terms of the model, noise model. Is there any point of discussion at this stage? All right. So, given that your noise is white sense stationary <coughs> Gaussian and has a power spectral density function of S sub n of f. What can I say about the noise power at the output of the receiver? What we are saying is at the input to the receiver, at the input to the receiver, you have a noise function nt, whose noise process nt, whose power spectral density function is S and F, right. What will be the input noise power? Suppose I ask you what is the value of n sub i? How is the power? noise power related to the spectral density the area under the spectral density is the total noise power or the average noise power right. If you assume it is a white noise process what is the amount of noise present in the input infinite. So what is the signal to noise ratio of the input 0 right 0 in terms of absolute value and minus infinity in terms of dv decibels right is it clear so if it is white noise process however the output noise power how do you calculate the output noise power Sir, to do that first you must find the output power spectral density function right what is the output power spectral density function it will be s n f into We will substitute that. So, this is the output power spectral density function. Integrate this density function over all frequencies and that gives you the variance of the output noise process or the noise output power, right. In our case, this will be let us say minus p to plus b, but since it is a obviously an even function, the power spectral density function has to be even. This is also magnitude square. So, you can simply say twice of 
0 to b and let us assume it is white what is the pass spectral density function then n by 2 right and this is constant equal to 1 between 0 to b right so df how much is that equal to right the value of this integer is equal to nb and that you can intuitively see why it is nb input input noise has a flat pass spectral density function you are passing it through a filter like this this height is n by 2 so what is the total area of the output noise pass spectral the output noise spectrum will have the same shape right and the area under that is n by 2 into 2b which is nb so it is intuitively obvious so the output noise power is nb right and that is something that you would have to work with tolerate you cannot do anything about this noise this is the noise that will come through if you want your signal to come through your signal has this much bandwidth therefore you have to have a filter with this, this much bandwidth you cannot have filter with large with smaller bandwidth than this right because if you have a filter with smaller bandwidth than this it, your signal will get distorted however what you can do is not to have a filter with a bandwidth larger than b you should not choose a filter larger than the bandwidth of the signal because if you do that the noise that you will get in will be larger so this is the amount of noise minimum amount of noise that you will have to tolerate at the output of your receiver right so your signal power at the output is same as the input signal power the noise power of the output is mb right and therefore your signal to noise ratio at the output which is the figure of merit of interest to us is given by s sub i upon nb this is the result for a baseband communication system right so what is the result that the output signal to noise ratio in a baseband communication system is the ratio of the input signal power receiver input signal power to the noise pass spectral density times the bandwidth n by 2 times 2b right this nb is nothing but n by 2 into 2b you can consider as 2b the bandwidth in the sense of at least in this sense although actually conventional sense is to say the bandwidth is b but in the mathematical sense it has a bandwidth of 2b and this is a benchmark we cannot have in any system a signal to noise ratio which is better than this right you cannot have any any system with signal to noise ratio which is better than this is that clear sir if noise is white white if noise is white assuming that the noise is white right so this therefore in that sense it is a benchmark we will call this benchmark I am now following more or less lattice notation here right so you find it easy to read this portion uh, from that book so um, we will call this parameter as gamma and we will say that this is equal to gamma right so everything else that we do will be in terms of uh, this benchmark we will try to compare in terms of this benchmark incidentally uh, one last thing that we can uh, briefly talk about is how can we express this s sub o in terms of mt hmm? what will be the s sub i or s sub o in terms of mt also we are in this discussion we are assuming everything is ideal we have ignored the attenuation so if there is an attenuation there will be an attenuation factor which will come in because finally what is of important is what is the input power right that already takes care of the attenuation <coughs> But suppose there is no attenuation, how will this SI be related to MT? MF into H into H. Not MF. We do not talk in terms of MF anymore if you are modeling MT to be a random process. Again, we have to talk about the power spectral density function of MT, right? SMF, right? So that is right. So again, your M square that is the average value of m t m square t which is expected value of m square t right 
that will be a signal power also that is given by twice 0 to b of s n f d f where s n f is a power spectral density function of noise okay so that is the main result that is output s n r in a baseband system is equal to s sub i upon n b that is the best thing that one can do right now where do a m systems stand in this context I must modify this statement when I said this is the best thing that one can do I am referring to linear systems right we will find later that indeed modulation schemes like F M and M A M can do much better than this right as to how they do better is something that will become clear later so I should not have made that statement we will say this is just simply a benchmark that this is what the baseband systems can do and we will compare everything else with respect to this figure right I think that is a better way of putting it. So now let us come to AM systems and the first system AM system that we will discuss is the DSPSA system and you will find that the method of analysis is more or less the same we will draw a picture of the system look at the um, look at the signal power and input to the receiver noise power of the input to the receiver noise power spectral density right and signal power of the output the and so on and so forth. So let us draw the diagram what do you do first you multiply this with the carrier. I will denote the carrier here by root 2 cosine omega ct. Hmm? The multiple this, uh, this, but this root 2 has been included to normalize the power the message power to the same value as before right we will discuss that. That is all transmitter that is all we are doing modulating the signal right multiplying it with the carrier channel is again we will assume to be ideal but it is not going to be ideal low pass now it will be ideal band pass right that is it will have a perfect or flat transfer function between minus b to plus b it has to have to a bandwidth of 2b now not b center of fc right so it is a band pass we are not showing it here but keep that in mind right the only effect of the channel that we will consider here is this please no it is not minus b to plus b it is f c minus b to f c plus b and similarly we will have on the negative side between minus f c minus b to minus f c plus b so that is implicit I am not stating that right but the bandwidth is 2b the mathematical bandwidth if you like to use such a term will be 4b for the purpose of calculating the noise power because it will be n by 2 into 4b right. So that the only effect the channel that therefore we will consider is again noise we will assume that the channel is ideal band pass channel which is ideal and what will the receiver consist of now the receiver will have a band pass filter centered around fc right that is a starting point so we will have a band pass filter uh, with frequency fc and bandwidth plus minus b hertz <coughs> right and then what will you have you have the demodulator right channel noise you already have you have eliminated part of the channel noise through this filter right and the rest of it is the demodulator right. So demodulator is essentially once again a multiplier root 2 cosine omega ct followed by a baseband low pass filter <coughs> bandwidth is <coughs> b hertz. And for convenience, I look at 
you know, we look at the input parameter. Uh, let's say if I were to write y i t here, right? What will I get here? This the input to the demodulator. This is your demodulator, right? Let's look at the input to the demodulator. Y sub i t. So the subscript i now denotes the input to the demodulator. Right? What will that be equal to? So this is equal to root two. What will you get here? What are you transmitting? Root two nt cosine omega ct plus nt. But after bandpass filtering, the signal part will be the same as before, isn't it? But nt, which was white Gaussian so far, would become narrow band, wide, uh, narrow band Gaussian. The power spectrum will get modified to have a bandwidth of 2b. Right. So how do I denote this noise? It will be. Let me call this uh, the signal. This uh, y, yit which contains sit and nit. Right. And this is equal to root 2 cosine root. I'm sorry. Let me rewrite it. Yit is equal to root 2 nt cosine omega ct plus nit, where nit is narrow band. Gaussian noise, right? And therefore, it can be denoted by. Remember, there is a quadrature representation. Let's call it, and this is a standard notation, n sub c t cosine omega c t. I have slightly modified it from our earlier modification. C here first stands for the same as cosine. So in phase, sometimes is also designated as n c, right? And similarly. N sub S T sin omega C T, right? So you can write the noise process here N sub I T, which is a narrow band Gaussian process, in terms of its two quadrature components, which are now being represented by the in phase component is being represented by N sub C T, the quadrature component by N sub S T. Okay? So what will be minus N I T? It you can call it plus or minus. It doesn't make any big difference. In as far as the properties of the resulting process are concerned. You could do that. What is the signal power here? The signal power that you will have here is the this power, right? The power in this signal, power in this part of the thing, isn't it? At the input to a demodulator, this is your signal component, right? So the power in this component is your signal power at the input. So what is S sub i? It is expected value of root 2 mt cosine omega ct whole square, expected value of this square, right? Which you can write, take the cosine square inside, uh, take the square inside, it is expected value of uh, m square t into 2 cosine omega square, cosine square omega ct which again you can write as m square t into 1 plus cosine 2 omega c t right m square t here right. So what is this equal to? The first part is nothing but your message power right and the second part would be what can you say about the second part? It hmm? will be 0 right is that clear? So this is equal to m square bar. So now you see why the factor root 2 was included because this will make sure that s sub i is once again equal to m square bar the same value that we had earlier. Okay. What can we say about the noise power now very quickly. Hmm? When you demodulate this is a signal at the input of the demodulator. What will be the output of the demodulator? Okay, I think before that we must calculate n sub i. n sub i is how much? It does not require much uh, calculation for that. No, just uh, even looking at without doing any calculation, can you tell me what is n sub i here? Here what is n sub i? 
infinity right same as before what is capital n sub i at this point it is n by 2 which is the power spectral density of the input into 4 b right so it is 2 n b right so n sub i is 2 n b okay and what are you seeing at the output this is as far as the input is concerned input is the demodulator what will be the output of the demodulator let me call this y o t this is the input of the demodulator what will be the output of the demodulator you are multiplying with root to, root to cosine omega c t and see what, what will you get you get m t plus 1 by root 2 of n c t right so the output will be m t plus 1 by root 2 n c t okay so what is your output signal power same as the input signal power right what is your output noise power it is half of average value of n c square and what is the important property that I, I gave this as an exercise in the quadrature representation of noise you have to show that each of the two, each of the two quadrature components has the same power as the message as the noise process itself as a narrow band noise process itself but the narrow band noise process here was NIT right NCT is a uh, in phase component of that so this power is same as 2NB same as this so this is equal to half of 2 n b in same as n b so once again if you call this as s i s o equal to s i what do you find the output s n r is once again s i upon n b it is the same as comma right so how do we get n o to be half n c i mean n b using the fact that n c square t average value of this is equal to average value of this is equal to average value of the noise power itself this was an exercise I asked you to do it is very simple to prove it please prove it and that is what that is the result I am using here right okay. so we find that we just conclude that in as far as signal to noise ratio figure of merit is concerned there is no difference between the baseband system and the modulation system which was something that we could have expected intuitively right and therefore it is not a very surprising result we will discuss it further next time thank you